Old Testament and the New Man, Genesis through Joshua with Dr. Daniel Canty. As the modern order enters its apparent sunset, Dr. Canty looks anew at the ancient scriptures to learn what they teach about man and his world. Here he is with today's episode. Hello, I'd like to welcome all of you to this episode of the Old Testament and the New Man. My name is Daniel Canty. In this episode, we're going to begin our examination of the book of Joshua. Now, the book of Joshua is basically about two things. The first is the conquest and occupation of the promised land by the people of Israel. So there's a military story for roughly the first half of the book of Joshua. The second half of the book of Joshua is the apportionment of the land to the different tribes. It is their coming to rest in the land that God has given them. So the first half of the book you have about military occupation and essentially a military campaign to take the land. And then you have the rest in the land in the second half. Tonight we're really only going to cover the first half. We'll get to the second half in the next episode. But for now... What we are going to do is walk through the story of the, uh, of the military conquest, and then I will make some comments at the end of the story. So most of this is just going to be walking through the text with a little bit of analysis at the end. And I'll make some points, of course, along the way. So we're going to begin here with Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, you and all this people, and cross over Jordan into the land I will give them. So it is Joshua who is the one who is going to bring the people into the promised land. And St. John Chrysostom reminds us at this point of the similarity of name between Jesus and Joshua. He, that is the Joshua of the Old Testament, brought the people into the promised land, says St. John Chrysostom. As, Je as Jesus brought the people into heaven. And the Aramaic name for Jesus is Yeshua, which is obviously quite close to the Hebrew Joshua. It is the same name. And so you have the Joshua, or Jesus, of the Old Testament, bringing people to rest into the promised land. And then you have Jesus, or Yeshua, of the New Testament, bringing people into the promised land, which is eternal life. One brings his people into a physical rest. The other brings all of those who have faith in his name and who follow him into an eternal and spiritual rest. And so these two figures are parallel. We see already here at the very beginning of the text. The Lord continues talking to Joshua. Every place on which you tread with your feet, I will give it to you, as I said to Moses. Your territories shall be the desert and Lebanon as far as the great river, the Euphrates, and from the setting of the sun to the farthest sea. No man shall be able to oppose you all the days of your life, as I was, and as I was with Moses, thus I will be also with you. I will not forsake you nor disregard you. I will be with you, God says to Joshua, as he said to the patriarchs, as he said to Moses. I will be with you. Be strong, therefore, God continues, and courageous, and to guard yourself and to do as Moses, my servant, commanded you. The book of this law shall not depart from your mouth, and you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may have the understanding to do all the things written therein. Be strong and courageous. Do not be cowardly or fearful, for the Lord your God is with you in all things wherever you go. Twice here, we see an exhortation to be courageous. The second time, be strong and courageous, do not be cowardly or fearful. It's important to remember here, I think, that the Israelites are going to battle. And there are times, a little bit later on in the story that we're going to see, where it seems like they are just this unstoppable force. Everyone that they go against gets crushed. They wipe out everything in front of them. And you would think there was just no fear because God is with them. And the temptation to cowardice was not even a live option for them. But I think that's to misread what is going on here. Already twice at the beginning, God says, be courageous, encouraging Joshua in this manner. And then specifically, don't be cowardly or fearful. Human fear is still a real part of what is happening. They are going to war. The possibility of death is there. So that's to be remembered in all that follows all this military story that we're going to be going over. Verse 10, 
Then Joshua commanded the scribes of the people, saying, Enter the midst of the people's camp, and command the people, saying, Prepare the food supply, for yet three days you shall cross this Jordan. And he says to the leaders of the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, whom you may remember already have their lands on the east side of the Jordan River, he says to them, Look, the Lord your God has already caused you to rest and has given you this land, the land on the east side of the Jordan. But you are to come over and to fight with us. Remember that until the Lord your God has caused your brethren to rest, and you as well, and they have taken possession of the land which the Lord your God has given them, until these things have happened, you do not actually get to stay and abide in the land that has been apportioned to you. You are to go over and fight with us. And so the leaders of these tribes respond in the affirmative to Joshua, saying, yes, we will go over and we will fight. So Israel, as a unified nation, is going to cross over the Jordan, and they are going to occupy the land that God intends to give them. Moving on to chapter 2. After this, Joshua, son of Nun, sent out two young men from Acacia Grove to spy out the land, saying, Go and see the land and Jericho. And so they send the two young men to Jericho, and they went into the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. Here is what St. Cassiodorus Senator has to say about Rahab. Quote, Rahab was a harlot who secretly admitted the spies of Joshua when they visited Jericho and let them out by another exit so that they should not be captured. Her name means pride. She was converted by God's generosity and deserved to obtain mercy. She is a type of the church, which takes in souls endangered by the vice of pride and lets them out into life by another route, the way of humility and patience. So we see this, this uh, metaphor for the church in Rahab, a type for the church in Rahab, arguably the most unlikely of places to find this. But moving on with the story. It was reported to the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men from the sons of Israel have come to spy on us. So he goes and he speaks to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men. But she took the men and hid them. She took the Israelites and hid them from the messengers from the king of Jericho. And she spoke to them, saying, The men from the king came to me, but as the gate... I'm sorry. She, she said to the men from the king of Jericho, The men of Israel came to me, but as the gate was being shut in the darkness, the men went out... I do not know where they went. Pursue them, if indeed you may overtake them. But in fact, Rahab had led the spies to the roof and hid them in the stalk of flax that she had piled together on the roof. So she hides them in her apartment, in her dwelling, while she sends the messengers of the king in another direction and lies to them, tells them, well, no, the men are not here. So what do we do with her lying? How exactly should we address this? Here's what St. Augustine says about it, St. Augustine of Hippo. He says, quote, Therefore no lie is just. Accordingly, when examples of lying are proposed to us from the sacred scriptures, either they are not lies, but are thought so for not being understood, or if they are lies, they are not to be imitated because they cannot be just. As for its being written that God dealt well with the Hebrew midwives and with the Rahab and with Rahab the harlot of Jericho, he did not deal well with them because they lied, but because they were merciful to the men of God. And so it was not their deception that was rewarded, but their benevolence and the benignity of their intention, not the iniquity of their invention, end quote. So in other words, even though Rahab will get away with doing this, even though she will be rewarded by God later on, she's not rewarded for the lie. The lie itself is still a sin to be dealt with, but it is her mercy that grants her the reward, so says St. Augustine. Now, after Rahab has sent them away, sent the men from, king, from the king of Jericho away, the men searched for the spies along the road to the Jordan, to the fords, and the gate was closed. Then it came to pass when the men who had pursued the spies <clears throat> went after them, and before the spies went to sleep, that Rahab went to the spies on the roof and said, I know that the Lord gave you the land, for fear of you has fallen upon us. We heard what you did to Sihon and to Og, those kings on the east side of the Jordan, whom you utterly destroyed. She also says, Now therefore, swear to me by the Lord God that as I showed you mercy, 
You shall also be merciful to me in my father's house and capture alive all in my house, my father and mother and my brothers and everything they have, and deliver my soul from death. As I have been merciful to you, Rahab says to the spies, so you be merciful to me. Or to summarize the lesson from the Beatitudes, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. This is what Rahab asks for in this passage. So the men respond positively to her. They say, our life for your life, even to death. And she then said, when the Lord shall deliver the city to you, deal with me in mercy and truth. And after this, she let them down through the window and said to them, go away to the hill country, hide there for three days, and then depart and go your way. And the men say, in response to her, we will be without fault regarding this oath of yours. For behold, we will come into a part of the city, and you will set a sign. You shall hang this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. Then you shall gather your fa yourself and your father and mother and your brothers into your father's house, and they will be safe there. The Orthodox Study Bible gives us the following note on this. This is chapter 2, verse 18. The scarlet cord, it says, was a type of the Lord's passion, of his mystical blood which would redeem the world. Rahab understood something of this mystery, therefore her repentance and faith saved her. And this note is drawn from St. Ambrose of Milan, that here we have a type of the Lord's passion, which is saving. So the spies departed from Rahab and went to the hill country and remained there three days. And the pursuers searched all the roads, but could not find them. And they finally make their way back to Joshua. And they say, the Lord will deliver all the land into our hand, for everyone who inhabits that land cowers in fear because of us. It's really fascinating to think that Rahab and the spies agree that Jericho will fall, not because it is militarily weaker, not because it has fewer people, not because of physical qualities, but rather the quality of the heart and the fear that is in the heart. That is what it is that dooms Jericho in terms of the immediate or proximate causes within the people. So after the spies return, moving into chapter 3 now, the Israelites are going to cross the Jordan. And the ark is carried before the people, <coughs> before the people, and Joshua says to them regarding this, that the ark moving before them as they go to the Jordan. He says to them, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow when they will cross, because tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua says to the priests, take up the ark of the covenant of the Lord and go before the people. And so the priests took up the ark of the covenant and went before the people. Then the Lord said to Joshua, today I shall exalt you in the sight of all the children of Israel, so they will know that I shall be with you as I was with Moses. Very important that God is with the people as they move through this military conquest because God is their ability to be victorious. His presence guarantees them the victory, as it were. The Lord gives Joshua this command. Therefore now command the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, saying, as soon as you enter a part of the water of the Jordan, then you shall stand in the Jordan. They will stand still in the Jordan. And when the feet of the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth rest in the water of the Jordan, that is when they stop and when they are no longer active, then the water of the Jordan will cease to flow and the upstream water will stand still. So in effect, what is going to happen is that when the priests come to rest with the Ark in the water, the waters will separate. They will part and the people will walk through on dry land. And in fact, when they step into the river, the upstream waters, upstream waters stopped flowing downstream, and a solid wall of water formed over a very great distance as far as the region of Adam. This is verse 16. <clears throat> verse 17, So the priests who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all the children of Israel crossed on dry ground until all the people had made the way, their way over. For some of you, you will be familiar with the Exodus and know that the Red Sea parts and the people move through it, and this is how they get away from the Egyptian army and how they, how they leave Egypt. But there is a second crossing between bodies of water on dry ground in the Old Testament, and it is here at the Jordan. 
So just as the people leave Egypt between walls of water that have been parted for them to go through on dry ground, here now they enter the promised land, again, between walls of water that have been parted so that the people can go through on dry ground. There is a connection here between the story in Joshua and the story of the Exodus. Arguably, there's a kind of inverse that's going on in the Exodus. The people are going out in, in the story of Joshua and the occupation. The people are going in, but they go out and they come in the same way. If you think about it as kind of doorway, well, the door opens, you go out and you come in, but you're passing through the same sort of liminal phase, if you will, liminal area. But there's a connection with Exodus that I want to come back to. This is not the first or rather the last connection with Exodus that we are going to see. We're going to see it again. Moving on to chapter 5. This is chapter 5, verse 1. Then it came to pass when the kings of the Amorites on the other side of the Jordan and the kings of the Phoenicians near the sea heard that the Lord God had dried up the Jordan River before the children of Israel when they crossed over. Their minds fainted, they were panic-stricken, and there was no more sense left in them because of the presence of the children of Israel. Again, this is a harbinger of the victory of the people of Israel because the peoples of the land now fear them. They are panic-stricken, their minds fainted. And there was no more sense left in them. They are in no state to go out and win militarily before this force that clearly has God on its side. It's notable that after this and before we get to the Battle of Jericho, that there is a circumcision of all those who have not yet been circumcised of the second generation, the younger generation that was in the desert. So there's a circumcision that happens, and then there's a Pascha that is celebrated. Both of these happen in uh, chapter 5. Interestingly, the same things happen in the story of Exodus. There is a circumcision and there is a celebration of Pascha that go hand in hand with crossing the Red Sea that happened just before the Red Sea. Here they happen after the crossing of the Jordan. Chapter 5, verse 3, So Joshua made sharp stone knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at the place called the Hill of Foreskins. And in this manner, Joshua completely purified the sons of Israel, as many as were born at any time along the way, and as many as were uncircumcised after they came out of Egypt. St. John of Damascus has this to say about this passage, speaking of circumcision and connecting it to baptism. Quote, Now this circumcision was a figure of baptism. For just as circumcision cuts off the body, cuts off from the body, a part which is not useful, but a useless superfluity, so by holy baptism are we circumcised of sin. It is obvious that sin is a superfluity of concupiscence and of no use. Concupiscence, by the way, is, uh, is another word for desire. Oftentimes it's used for sexual desire, but not necessarily just desire for pleasure more generally. Here, going on with St. John, he says, For it is impossible for anyone not to have any concupiscence at all, or to be entirely without any taste for pleasure. But the useless part of pleasure, this is the sin which holy baptism circumcises, end quote. So we have a, an instructive connection, I think, between circumcision and baptism there from St. John of Damascus. As uh, part of our story here, the Israelites, again, are circumcised before they celebrate the Pascha. <clears throat> Chapter 5, verse 12, after they celebrate the Pascha west of Jericho on the plain, on that day, God's giving of the manna ceased. The giving of the manna that happens throughout their time in the desert up until this day. And after they ate from the wheat of the land, thus the children of Israel no longer had manna, for they enjoyed the fruits in the land of the Phoenicians in that year. And it is at this time, just before the people go to fight against Jericho, that the commander of the Lord's hosts comes to Joshua. Then it came to pass, when Joshua was at Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing before him with a sword drawn in his hand. So Joshua came near and said to him, Are you for us or on the side of our adversaries? And the man said to him, I am now come the chief captain of the host of the Lord. Then Joshua fell on his face upon the earth and said to him, O master, what do you command your servant? 
And the chief captain said of, of the Lord said to Joshua, Loose the shoe from your feet, for the place on which you stand is holy. This chief captain is understood by the tradition to be the archangel Michael, who comes to lead the Israelites to complete victory so that they will possess the land. And so again, it is clear God is with the people as they go to do what they are going to do. He is with them. He will give them victory. Now, after the appearance of the archangel Michael comes the story of the defeat of Jericho. Chapter 6, verse 1. Jericho was enclosed and fortified, and no one went out of or into it. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Behold, I will deliver Jericho into your hand, its king and its army of soldiers who are mighty. But place your soldiers around it, and it shall come to pass that when you sound with the trumpet, let all the people shout together, and when they shout, the walls of the city shall fall by themselves. So it is not military might that is going to bring down the walls of the city. It is an act of God that will make these fortified walls fall before them. <clears throat> so Joshua told the priests, command the people to go around and surround the city and let the men of war pass on armed before the Lord. And so they did this for six days. Each day Joshua said to them, do not shout nor let anyone hear your voice until the day I myself tell you to shout and then shout. So they surround the city for six days and then they go back to their camp. Verse 14 of chapter 6. On the seventh day, the Israelites rose early in the morning and went around the city six times. Then it came to pass that as they marched around the seventh time, the priests blew the trumpets, and Joshua said to the sons of Israel, Shout, for indeed the Lord has handed over the city to you. For the city shall be accursed by the Lord, it and whatever is in it. However, preserve Rahab the harlot and whatever is in her house. But be very careful, Joshua says, to keep yourself from what is accursed, lest, lest you yourself consider to take from it what is accursed, and then you shall make the camp of the children of Israel a curse and destroy us. But all the silver, the gold, the bronze, or the iron shall be holy to the Lord and brought into the treasury of the Lord. So in other words, God is going to give them the city, but make sure that you don't take of anything of what belongs to God. Because the things being accursed and the things belonging to God are equivalent here. They don't belong to the people. God has cursed the city, therefore whatever comes out of it belongs to him. It's not to be pilfered by any of the Israelites who might desire it. So on that seventh day, the priests sounded the trumpets, and when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, they shouted together with a great shout. And the entire wall fell round about, and the people went into the city. And from there, they conquered it. The city with everyone in it was set on fire, but the silver, the gold, the bronze, and the iron they brought into the treasury of the Lord. And so here we have God acting miraculously to destroy a city's defenses. And so the credit for the victory very clearly goes to God. It is his action. The commander of the Lord's army has just come. God has, says to jo has said to Joshua, I will be with you. And so we have evidence of that in what happens here to the city of Jericho. Joshua told the people, cursed be the man who rebuilds that city, Jericho. So the Lord was with Joshua and his name was known throughout all the land. And so it seems that things have gone very well for the Israelites so far. God is with them. They have destroyed the first of the cities that they have gone up against in this very miraculous way, a way that, again, would send panic and fear into all of those who hear of it because of what the God of Israel has done for his people. So you would think that they are now on a roll and that they're going to keep going with these military victories, but that's not the case. Moving into chapter 7, but the children of Israel committed a great offense for they kept back for themselves something from what was accursed. In other words, they were told not to take anything from the city of Jericho because it was holy to the Lord and belonging to him. But Achan the son of Carmi, took something from what was accursed, and the Lord was very angry with the sons of Israel. St. Gregory the Wonder Worker says this in comment on Achan taking from the spoil. He says, Look, 
Did not Achan the son of Zerah dishonestly steal from the devoted things, and wrath came upon the whole people of Israel? And he alone sinned, but he was not the only one to die in his sin. Now to us, in the present circumstance, every asset which does not belong to us, but to someone else, should be regarded as the devoted things. For he, Achan, took as spoil, and these men now have taken as spoil. But what he took, but he took what belonged to the enemy, while these now have taken what belonged to their brothers, making for themselves a deadly profit. So there's a really interesting and novel application of what it means to take the devoted things by St. Gregory. It is simply to steal from our neighbors or from our brothers. Those things, as it were, are devoted to God, and we are not to be thieves of them. So Achan has taken of the things devoted to God, and God is angry. And so in the next scene here, the Israelites go up to battle against the town of Ai. They only send 3,000 men against it because it's not a very, very big, uh, it's not a very big town. So about 3,000 men went up, but they fled, fled from the face of the men of Ai. The men of Ai killed 36 of them and pursued them from the gate, and they crushed them on the steep slope. So the hearts of the people were terrified and became as water. And in this case, it's the hearts of the Israelites who are fearing. Before it was the people of Jericho, now it is the people of Israel. When Joshua hears about this, he tears his clothes and he falls to the ground before God, both he and the elders of Israel. And he says to God, I beseech you, O Lord, why did your servant lead this people over the Jordan to deliver them to the Amorite to destroy us? In other, in other words, why are we here if we're just going to lose and be killed? But God says to Joshua in response, rise up, why have you fallen upon your face? The people sinned and transgressed the covenant I made with them, for they stole something from what was accursed and put it among their goods. They will turn their backs before their enemies because they are accursed, and I will not be with you until you remove the accursed thing from among you. So God says, in contrast to what he has said before, when over and over again he says, I will be with you, now that the Israelites have sinned, the message is, I will not be with you. If you disobey God's commandments and he is not with you in the same way, he turns away from you. God says to Joshua, you shall not be able to stand against your enemies until you remove the accursed thing from among you. And so God commands Joshua to call all the people together, to gather them together by tribes and let the tribes pass before the Lord. And when the tribe pass, the different tribes pass before the Lord, one of those tribes will be selected. And as that tribe passes before the Lord in families, one of those families will be selected. And as that family passes before the Lord by households, one of those households will be selected. Until finally the household passes and the man himself, the one who has stolen, is selected. And whoever is pointed out, he shall be burned with fire along with whatever he has, because he transgressed the covenant of the Lord and brought lawlessness in Israel. This is the command that God has given Joshua to do. So the next morning, Joshua does this. The tribes pass before God, and the tribe of Judah is selected. Then they're brought out family by family within the tribe, and the family of Zara was pointed out. And after this, this is verse 17, after this, man by man came before God, and Achan, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, was pointed out. And so Joshua said to Achan, give glory to the Lord God of Israel today and make confession. Tell me what you did and hide nothing from me. So Achan, knowing that the game is up, knowing that he has been caught, answered Joshua and said, truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. Thus and thus I did. I saw a beautiful multicolored garment in the spoil and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of 50 shekels of gold. I desired them and took them. Behold, they are hidden in the ground in my tent, and the silver is concealed under them. So Joshua sends messengers, and they run to Achan's tent, and they find the things hidden just as he said. And after this, Joshua took Achan, the son of Zerah, 
and led him up to the valley of Achor, along with his sons and daughters and his calves and all his donkeys and his sheep, his tent, and all his belongings. So all of his family, all of his possessions come. Joshua takes them to the valley of Achor, and there he says to Achan, Why did you destroy us? May the Lord destroy you this very day. Then all Israel stoned him with stones, and they put over him a great heap of stones. And the Lord ceased from the wrath of his anger. So Achan sins against God. Punishment comes upon the people of Israel. Thirty-six men die the next time that they go out, and God is no longer going to be with them. And so Achan is found out, and he and all of his household, the small household, but he and his sons and daughters, his animals, his possessions, all of it is destroyed. Now, St. Basil the Great comments on this, on the judgment of Achan. What are we to think of this justice of God, this, uh, this penalty, which seems to modern ears to be quite harsh? And this is a, a rather long comment here, but I think it's worth reading in whole. on the whole. St. Basil says, Accordingly, I find in taking up the Holy Scripture that in the Old and New Testament, contumacy toward God is clearly condemned, not in consideration of the number or heinousness of transgressions, but in terms of a single violation of any precept whatsoever. And further, that the judgment of God covers all forms of disobedience. In the Old Testament, I read of the frightful end of Achan and the account of the man who gathered wood on the Sabbath day. And uh, breaking away here from St. Basil, the account of the man who gathered wood on the Sabbath day, that's in Numbers, where there's a man who gathers wood on the Sabbath and he's killed for doing this, for, uh, for gathering wood. Moving on with St. Basil, he says, Neither of these men, Achan and the men who gathered wood, neither of these men was guilty of any other offense against God, nor had they wronged a man in any way, small or great. But the one merely for his first gathering of wood paid the inescapable penalty and did not have an opportunity to make amends. For by the command of God, he was forthwith stoned by all his people. The other, only because he had pilfered some part of the sacrificial offerings, even though these had not yet been brought into the synagogue, nor had been received by those who performed this function. He was the cause not only of his own destruction, but of that also of his wife and children, and of his house and personal possessions besides. Moreover, the evil consequences of his sin would presently have spread like fire over his nation. And this too, although the people did not know what had occurred and had not excused the sinner. Unless his people, sensing the anger of God from the destruction of the men who were slain, had promptly been struck with fear. And unless Joshua, son of Nun, sprinkling himself with dust, had prostrated himself together with the ancients, and unless the culprit discovered thus by Lot, had paid the penalty mentioned above. Perhaps someone will raise the objection that these men might plausibly be suspected of other sins for which they were overtaken by these punishments. Yet the Holy Scripture made mention of these sins alone as very serious and worthy of death. So, what's the main reason for Achan and his family and his possessions, all of this destruction for what they have done? According to St. Basil, the evil consequences of his sin would have spread like fire over his nation. And the consequences of that sin is ultimately the destruction and suffering of the nation. We've seen this in several instances. If you disobey God and God turns away from the people, then there is a greater, a larger amount of destruction as a result of this. And so in order for this not to happen, we see the example in the Old Testament of the sin literally being exterminated and the example being given to the rest of the people so that they will not follow that same path. Now, once Achan is no longer with the people of Israel, he and all of his household are no more. Once this happens, the people go back against the, uh, the city of Ai, and they defeat it, and they destroy it. We're told, the army struck down the men of Ai until there was not one of them left who survived and escaped. But they took the king of Ai alive and brought him to Joshua. And then Joshua burned the city with fire. He made it an uninhabited heap forever, even to this day. The king of Ai, in addition, was hanged on a forked tree. I want to pay attention here to this phrase. The army struck them down 
until there was not one of them left who survived and escaped. And this phrase, I said a moment ago that it, that it applies to the men of the city, but really it applies to the entire city. No one escaped. All of them were struck down. There was not one of them left who survived and escaped. We're going to see this again, and I, I want to sort of uh, put an asterisk by it so that we will remember it, because this is, um, this is the pattern of Israelite victory. In chapter 9, verse 1, When the kings of the Amorites on the other side of the Jordan, and those in the hills and in the lowland and in all the coasts of the great sea, and those near Lebanon, the, and the Hittites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites, when all of these different tribes who are in the promised land, when they heard what had happened, they all came together in one place to war against Joshua and Israel. So there are forces now coming together to try to meet the Israelites because they've defeated Jericho and they've defeated the people of Ai. At this point in the story, Joshua reaffirms the covenant with the people. <clears throat> he reads the law to them. He, build, he builds an altar on Mount Ebal. So he is reaffirming their connection with the God who is with them. Also at this point in the story, the Gibeonites, who are another one of the tribes in the Promised Land, they come to the people of Israel, to the leaders, Joshua and the elders, and they carry out a deception with regard to Joshua and the elders, the Gibeonites act as though they are people from far away, that they don't actually live in the promised land, and they make a peace pact with Joshua and the elders. And Joshua doesn't consult the Lord before making this pact, so he makes the pact with the Gibeonites. And then, lo and behold, they reveal themselves as actually being people in the land. And so now Joshua is sort of caught in his oaths. He can't go to battle against them. He has to leave them alone because he's already made the agreement. But he says to them, this is chapter 9, verse 29, he says to the leaders of the Gibeonites, Now therefore you are cursed, and there shall not fail to be a servant nor a woodcutter among you to serve me and my God. And they answered Joshua, saying, It was reported to us what the Lord your God ordered his, serv what the Lord your God ordered his servant Moses to give you this land and to destroy us and all who dwell in it from before you. This, thus we did this thing because we feared greatly for our lives before you. So because of this deception, Joshua delivered the Gibeonites on that day from the hands of the children of Israel, and the Gibeonites survived. They were not killed. On that day, Joshua appointed them to be woodcutters and water carriers for the entire congregation and for the altar of God. And so the inhabitants of Gibeon became woodcutters and water carriers, water carriers, carriers for the altar of God until this very day, says the scripture, and for the place the Lord chose for himself. This is the only mention that we see in Joshua of the place the Lord your God shall choose, which is this kind of oblique reference to the temple that we saw in Deuteronomy. It's mentioned here at this one point in Joshua. Moving on into chapter 10. When Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and utterly destroyed it, and that he had done the same to Jericho and its king, <clears throat> Then they feared, for the, they feared greatly for themselves, for the king knew that Gibeon was a great city. So Adonai, king of, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, is worried about the presence of the Israelites. So he calls together with him several other kings. Together there's a total of five kings. The five kings of the Jebusites, the king of Jerusalem, of Hebron, of Jarmuth, of Lachish, of Eglon. They and all their people went up and besieged Gibeon and forced it to surrender. So now the Gibeonites are being attacked, and so what do the Gibeonites do? They appeal to the Israelites, and they say, come and help us. Come and do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly, they say to the Israelites. So Joshua goes up, and the Lord says to him, before he goes into battle, Do not fear them, for I have delivered them into your hands. Not one of them shall remain before you. Not one of them shall remain before you. Do not fear so Joshua came upon these kings of the Jebusites suddenly, for he had marched all night, and the Lord routed them from the face of the sons of Israel. And the Lord cast down hailstones on them from heaven as far as Azekah. And so victory is given to the Israelites by God 
and he is promised, Joshua is promised by God, not one of them shall remain before you. And this is the episode as well where the sun stands still for Joshua. They are given extra time in the day to be able to defeat the kings that have come before them. The five kings fled and they hid in a cave, but eventually they are found out and they are brought before Joshua. At the end of the day, they took Makeda, which was a nearby city. The Israelites took this city and struck it with the edge of the sword. They utterly destroyed every living thing in it. No one was spared or allowed to escape. So if we see another battle in which things are utterly destroyed, nothing is allowed to escape, nothing is spared. There is nothing with breath that is left in it. In the next passages, this is the second half of chapter 10 into chapter 11, we see summaries of the victories of the Israelites in the south and then also in the north. I'm going to just walk through these in turn. The first victory is against Libna, where we are told nothing was spared or allowed to escape. Then the city of Lachish, which was utterly destroyed as they had done, as the Israelites had done to Libna. Then Horam, the king of Gezer, marched up to help Lachish, but he was also defeated. Not one of his army was spared or allowed to escape. Then the Israelites came against the city of Eglon. They utterly destroyed it and every living thing in it, as they had done to Lachish. Then they departed to Hebron, and they destroyed it and every living thing in it. No one was spared. They destroyed it and everything, as they had done to Eglon. Then Joshua and all Israel returned to Debir and encamped around it. They utterly destroyed it along with every living thing in it. They spared nothing in it. After this, Joshua smote all the land of the hill country in the south and the plains of the land and Asadoth and her kings, and not one of them was spared. They utterly destroyed every living thing as the Lord God of Israel commanded from Kadesh Barnea to Gaza and all of Goshen as far as Gibeon. Joshua smote their kings and the land once and for all because the Lord God of Israel was fighting for Israel. The point here that we see in the conquest of the south is that all of these towns with their armies are wiped out. Nothing is left. It is utterly destroyed, it and everything in it. This means the men, the women, the children, the old, the young, the animals, everything. Everything is wiped out. In the north, chapter 11, when Jabin, the king of Hazor, heard this, he sent to Jobab, the king of Madon, to the king of Shimron, to the king of Akshaph, to the kings from the north in the mountains and in the plains south of Chinneroth in the lowland, many different kings of different tribes. They and their kings with them, as many in number as the sand of the sea, went out with a great many horses and chariots. All these kings came together to meet and camp together by the waters of Miram to war against Israel. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Fear not before their presence, for tomorrow at this hour I will deliver them to you and put them to flight in the sight of Israel. And this the Lord did. The Lord delivered them into the hands of Israel. And they defeated and chased them to Sidon, the great Sidon, to Book Mizpahoth, and eastward to the valley of Mizpah. They attacked them until there were no survivors. Then Joshua did to them as the Lord commanded him. And at that time, Joshua returned and seized the city of Hazor and its king. They put to death every living thing in it with the sword. They utterly destroyed them all, leaving no one alive, and set Hazor on fire. Joshua captured all the cities of their kingdoms and their kings, that is, all of the kings who went out against him, and put them to death by the edge of the sword. They utterly destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, ordered them. But Israel did not, burn, did not burn any of the fortified cities. Joshua only burned down Hazor. The children of Israel took all its spoils for themselves, and they completely destroyed everyone with the edge of the sword until there were no survivors. And uh, I want to read here, this is chapter 11, verse 14 from St. Augustine of Hippo on God's judgment and on the military conquest that we're seeing here, this wiping out of peoples. What today we would call a genocide is essentially what is happening. Men, women, children, all of them are being killed. So here's what St. Augustine says. 
One should not at all think it a, a horrible cruelty that Joshua did not leave anyone alive in those cities that fell to him, for God himself had ordered this. However, whoever for this reason thinks that God himself must be cruel and does not wish to believe then that the true God was the author of the Old Testament, judges as perversely about the works of God as he does about the sins of human beings. Such people do not know what each person ought to suffer. Consequently, they think it a great evil when that which is about to fall is thrown down and when mortals die. So St. Augustine says here, if we say, well, God is being cruel, and this, by the way, is a, uh, this is a complaint or an objection that is lodged against God um, by folks of various persuasions within Western Christendom and, and of course, outside the church. Um, when that charge is made, St. Augustine says to us, we don't understand the works of God, and we don't understand the sins of human beings. That there is something at play here that is beyond our own understanding. And I'm going to return to this in just a moment when we talk about the causes for what is happening here. But I just want to finish up with, uh, finish up with the story of the conquest, this last portion of chapter 11. <clears throat> chapter 11, verse 16. After this, Joshua took all of the hill country of the land, all the south, all the land of Goshen, the plains of the land, the land of the west, the mountain of Israel, the low country toward the mountain, all of these lands. He seized all their kings, took them away, and put them to death. Joshua waged war with these kings for many days, and there was not a city Israel did not take. They took them all in battle, for it was of the Lord to harden their heart to wage war against Israel, that they might be utterly destroyed and be shown no mercy but that they might be utterly destroyed, as the Lord said to Moses. At that, at that time, Joshua came and utterly destroyed the Anakim from the mountains, from Hebron, from Debir, Debir, from Anab, from all the nation of Israel, and from all the mountains of Judah, including their cities. And this is just to make sure with what I just read. He's not saying that he killed Israelites. He's saying all of the people who were in the land that would become the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom after the split of the kingdoms after Solomon, uh, and all the land that would become Judah, which is the southern kingdom. So the northern part of the land, the southern part of the land, uh, the Israelites essentially roll through it, and they defeat many, many peoples. They utterly destroy many, many peoples. And utter destruction and saying no one was spared, they're kind of virtual synonyms. If something is utterly destroyed, nothing is really left as a general rule here. In Joshua. Although, as we are going to see later on in Joshua and repeated in Judges, if we were to get there in this course, there are several cities that the Israelites did not take. So there are people left in the land. It's not like they've wiped out absolutely everything, but we'll, we'll see a little bit of that, uh, a little bit more of that next time. Verse 23, so Joshua took all the land as the Lord commanded Moses, and Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel by division according to their tribes. Then the land rested from war. <clears throat> and we'll get to this theme of rest in the, next, uh, in the next lecture. But here we are completing the story of the occupation. So I want to think a little bit about what to make of this story of the occupation. Over and over again, as we are told in these chapters in Joshua, they go against these cities or armies, and the, uh, the enemy is utterly destroyed. Not one of them remained. Things are just wiped out. So where do we see that elsewhere in the Old Testament? Because we've already seen it. This is not the first time that we've seen the phrase, not one of them remained. Now, utter destruction as a phrase we really only see in Joshua. But the idea that not one of them remained, we see in Exodus. When the army of the Pharaoh has gone into the Red Sea and the waters crash in upon, of them, upon them, we are told not one of them remained. So this is chapter 14, verse 28 of Exodus. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all of Pharaoh's army that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. Now, there's a connection here again, as we saw earlier, between what happens in Exodus and what happens in Joshua. And the point I want to make here 
is that when the Israelites roll through and they wipe out everything, when they wipe out the army, men, women, children, animals, you know, everything that made, say, the city of Hebron or everything that made the, the city of Lachish, it is gone. It's just devastated. What they are enacting is the military equivalent of a flood. That's essentially what is happening. So what these people have done is something that brings down the waters upon themselves, brings down the waters of destruction. The waters that we see in Exodus, specifically it says not so much as one of them remained, but something that harkens back even, I think, to the flood in Genesis, where all that is left in Noah and the people in the ark. The rest of the world is utterly destroyed. Nothing is left. So what we have here is a returning to the waters, but not as such, because there's not actual waters. There's not an actual flood. Instead, what you have is the army of the Israelites who are the de facto executors of that flood. They are the ones who bring it upon the people. Now, why then does this military flood come upon the people? What are the reasons that are given? Well, there are explanations that are given in the Old Testament. And here we're just kind of exploring the Old Testament logic. We saw this in Leviticus and we saw it in Deuteronomy. We're told two things in particular, two types of sins. The first is sexual perversion of various kinds. If you uh, go to Leviticus chapter 18, there are laws against all kinds of sexual morality. And I, I described this earlier as a kind of sexual free-for-all, people having sex with others who are within their biological family. There's just sort of kin relationships where people are having sex that are, you know, just deeply incestual. And there's, you know, problems all over the place in these commandments. But Leviticus 18 verse 24 uh, says, and this is God speaking to Moses, for by all these ways of life, the nations are defiled, which I am casting out before your face. For the land is defiled, and on its account I am repaying them for their wrongdoing. Thus the land became vexed with those dwelling upon it. And then God gives Moses commandments and says, Follow my ordinances and my judgments, that the land not be vexed with you and your defilement of it, as it was vexed with the nations before it. There's an implied connection between the people and the land. And if you act in certain ways that are contrary to nature, we might say, because these people presumably did not have God's law, they were not God's chosen people. But if you act in ways which are blatantly contrary to nature, then you are acting contrarily to the land that supports you. And the land is vexed with you. Nature, as it were, rejects you and responds against you. God says, on the land's account, I am repaying them for their wrongdoing. So in other words, it is to free the land from the burden of the people that they are being wiped out, that they are being destroyed. And that burden has to do with sexual behavior in Leviticus. The second reason that we saw does not have to do with sexual sin. It rather has to do with religious practice. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9. Now, if you enter the land the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to do the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who purifies his son or daughter in the fire, which we can you know, sort of take an educated guess on that people were, uh, were sacrificing their firstborn uh, in the fire. Or one who practices divination, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. And in an earlier lecture, I gave a single word for all of these practices for us today, and that is the occult. That if you practice divination, if you conjure spells, if you're a medium, you try to call up the dead, all of these kinds of things are an extra step beyond beyond normal idolatry it would seem just worship of other gods here you're taking it to uh, you're taking it to the nth degree as it were <clears throat> and this is part of the reason that the people will lose the land 
Verse 12, for all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord your God, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God will destroy them before you. For all these nations which you will dispossess, listened to soothsayers and diviners, but as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. So in other words, these kinds of practices were an abomination to God, an abomination before God, and so therefore the people will be dispossessed. They will be destroyed as a result of these things. And so the two sets of sins that we see are sexual sins on the one hand and then occultism on the other. And I would add in addition here that with all of the warnings against idolatry that we have seen throughout the Old Testament, it's very plausible to think that the people should destroy, you know, that God would say rather, that the Israelites should destroy the inhabitants of the land. And part of this is purifying the land so that the Israelites will have less of a temptation to be idolaters, because we're going to see that they certainly succumb to that temptation at one point or another. We're not going to see that actually in this class so much with such great depth, but if you look at the rest of the Old Testament, it's definitely there. <clears throat> I want to go back just briefly for comparison's sake. Let's take a look at Genesis chapter 6. This is the explanation of the flood. You know, why did the original flood happen? There's a couple of different reasons that are given. We'll start with the first one. The Lord God saw that man's wickedness was very great in the earth, and every intent of the thoughts within his heart was only evil continually. So God was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and he thought this over, and he decides that he's going to send the flood. Every intent of the thoughts within man's heart was only evil continually. It's the condition of the heart that causes the flood. And then verse 11, now the earth, this is still of chapter 6, verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt before God and filled with unrighteousness. Thus the Lord God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh corrupted their way on earth. Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with unrighteousness through them. And behold, I will destroy them on the earth. It's not really that difficult to hypothesize that the corruption that God sees at the flood in Genesis is not that different from all of the sexual sins that we see enumerated in Leviticus as how these peoples have defiled the land. And then... With the example of the occult, the people have turned away from God and are doing various kinds of unrighteous things. Now, behind this notion of sexual sin and notion of the occult that brings about this, um, brings about this punishment on the peoples who are there, behind this is the more generalized Old Testament notion that when people are destroyed, it is due to the works of their own hands. It is what they themselves have brought upon themselves. We see this not only in Joshua. We see it with the destruction of the Israelites when the northern kingdom is destroyed by the Assyrians, when the southern kingdom has Jerusalem destroyed and the people are exiled to Babylon. It is the works of their own hands that is coming back to them in some fashion. Not in a fashion they foresaw, obviously, but it is their own wicked deeds that come upon their heads. This is a consistent theme in the Old Testament. It is part of the Old Testament wisdom tradition. When something bad happens to you as a nation or as a people, it is because you as a nation or as a people have developed such horrible sinful habits that you brought this upon yourself, that you were the one who did this. God decides if it's going to happen sooner or later, and he may decide how it happens, but you are ultimately the one who has put yourself on this course. This is the reason, by the way, that when Job suffers so terribly, his friends come to him and they say, you must have done something. You did something wicked. That's why you're suffering like this. And Job protests and he says, well, no, I, I didn't do anything to deserve this. But when we come to civilizations, 
when we come to peoples and tribes, when we come to all of the people who are in the promised land, and then to the Israelites when they are in the promised land, the consistent theme is people have done something to bring this upon themselves. They have turned from God. They have sinned egregiously. They have somehow vexed the land. They have somehow divorced themselves from natural ways of being and from the place that God has given them. And so they meet this horrible end. But this horrible end is what they have woven for themselves. It is the course that they have given themselves, the destination that they themselves have set off, set off on. Such is the teaching of the scripture when it comes to this, these kinds of events. Next time, we will look over the second half of Joshua. The Old Testament and the New Man, Genesis through Joshua with Dr. Daniel Canty. Dr. Canty taught religion and philosophy at Bethel University from 2012 to 2019. He is a graduate of Yale Divinity School and Emory University and lives with his family in Clarksville, Tennessee. This has been a listener and viewer-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio.